Good morning, welcome to the Using Docker Track. Uh, my name's Elton, I'm the MC for today. So if you stay in here to watch all the sessions, which you should do because they're all great, you'll have to listen to me every now and then introducing people. So the, the first talk we've got today is from the very awesome Adrian, who is a Docker captain. If you're not familiar with the Docker captains, it's, a, it's a, like a community recognition thing. They're like the elite experts of Docker. They're the A-team of Docker. And they're not, they're not employees. They're, they're people who have done their own stuff. They're super experienced. They're super knowledgeable. And they invest a huge amount of time and effort sharing that knowledge and experience with the community. Um, Adrian was one of the very first captains. He's been doing it for a lot, long time. And he's collected a whole bunch of like, real-world tips and tricks that he's going to share with you today. So. Um, uh, try not to block the doors in case like there's a massive fire, but I'm sure there won't be. Um, and uh, please welcome Adrian. Thank you very much, Elton. There we go. So um, tools. Um, does anybody know what that is? Go on. What's it called, though? Yeah, exactly. Anyone? It's like a, a Docker's hook. So I thought it was kind of appropriate. But <laughs> um, yeah, so a Docker's hook is used for like carrying sacks about, I think, and uh, you know, like sacks of coal and sacks of grain and stuff. It looks quite a simple tool, but I'm willing to bet that um, it actually takes a little bit of skill and experience to use effectively. Uh, and that's certainly the case for stuff like hammers and saws and axes. So my dad's actually a builder, um, and if I try and use a saw, um, yeah, he takes it off me and, and does a job in a quarter of the time he would, just because he's an order of magnitude more skilled and he understands the tools better. Um, and I'm not saying it's a, a hardware tools and software tool and it's identical, but I think we can take the same lesson. So if we learn to use our tools better, like if we learn to understand the various features that Docker has uh, and the ways in which it works, um, I believe you can be more efficient and productive. Uh, and hopefully, in the course of this talk, you'll, you should all hopefully pick up one or two things that you can take away uh, and use um, in the rest of your time working with Docker. So uh, this is very much like a, sort of several small tips and tricks. Um, they do run the gamut. Like, so there is like tips more aimed at beginners, perhaps. Uh, but there's also like a, hopefully stuff for more advanced Docker users will still, will still pick up things. Um, I did try and sort of get the Docker captains to try and submit tips and tricks that I was going to put into this talk, and they have done that, but I've also taken out a bunch of stuff from the, the community at large as well. And I've tried to add references um, to where I got stuff from so you can go back and find further detail. And obviously the slides will be made available afterwards. Okay, so I've kind of broken this up into a, a few different sections. Uh, we're going to start with daily development. So this is sort of... Um, tips for helping you uh, with your daily sort of working with Docker. The first one is one that really kind of annoys me. You know when you type Docker PS and it just goes off the end of the terminal and it wraps around and you can't really tell what's going on? Yeah? A few of you. Yeah, so it turns out, or, and actually in the new sort of subcommand system, that's Docker Container LS, but Docker Container LS and Docker PS are the same command effectively. Um, but it turns out you can fix that. So if you pass the dash dash format argument, you can tell Docker Inspect exactly um, what output you want. Uh, so in this case, I said I want the, the familiar table format, um, but I want three fields. Oh, my point is not strong enough. Uh, I want three fields. I want the name, the image, and the status, and nothing else. Uh, and now my Docker PS command suddenly fits in like an 80 characters wide terminal. Um, and there's a bunch more fields you can add, so you can actually um, you know, put different status messages in if you want Docker PS to do something slightly different for your use case. Uh, so if you look at the Docker docs, there's a full uh, instructions there on how to use the command. Um, I accept that it would be pointless if every time you want to use this, you had to type Docker PS dash dash format. That just wouldn't be worth the effort. Um, I suppose you could alias it in a, a bash command, but uh, you can also write it into your Docker config.json file. So most people are probably, or some of you have probably seen the docker config.json file. Uh, it just contains various settings for your Docker client. Um, and you can add one called PS format. Um, so he, in this case, I've set my PS format to this. This is actually my own PS format settings. Um, and I've got four fields. And so it fits in most terminals. And it's a lot 
nicer and easy to use. And I generally don't miss the extra fields uh, in Docker PS. Um, do be a bit wary of this config.json file, though, because it actually includes your password to the Docker Hub. So don't copy it and send it to people. So just be aware of that. Um, again, there's a the docs for it. Let's click her. Is that right? Yeah. Uh, file mounting gotcha. Um, this one surprised me recently, and a, a fellow Docker captain helped me figure out what was going on. Um, if you mount a single file as a volume, so a file, not a directory, uh, and you want to edit that file, it might not work quite as you expect. So I've got an example here. What I do is I mount in this index.html file with the, the contents Moby rules. Uh, I'm mounting that as a volume uh, in an Nginx container, uh, and I'm running Nginx and exposing the port on localhost 8000. Uh, and that, when I curl localhost 8000, I do get back the expected output Moby rules. But um, if you then edit the file on the host, which you know you expect to update in the container simultaneously, um, and I change that to something else, so it now says Gordon rules, and then I curl localhost again, um, but I still get the old output Moby rules. Does anybody know why that is? You've got it, yeah. Um, so at first, I thought this was some strange caching thing. But it's not. It's because uh, volumes are mounted at the inode level. Uh, and generally, when you're using a text editor like Vi or Emacs, it actually saves files out to a, a new inode. Uh, and because the Docker volume is mounted at the inode, it never gets to see the new file. Um, generally, 99% of the time, the solution is not to mount a file. Instead, mount the directory. Right? So rather than mount the file, mount the directory that the file's in. Uh, and yeah. That's nearly always what you want to do. If for some reason you really do want to, to mount a file and be able to edit it, uh, you'll have to do something like uh, use sort of a, a bash commands, like redirects, to overwrite the file. Yeah, and it was uh, Antonis from the Docker Captain's program who helped me with that. Uh, clean up. Um, so you know when you type Docker image ls or Docker images, and you get a whole list of images, and you probably notice there's ones that are marked none. And that's a bit of confusing at first. You're kind of like, well, what's these none images? I didn't want any none images. Um, but what it is, if you do docker build uh, dash t, and you run that twice, what happens is the tag points to the new image, but your old image is still there on disk. It just, there's no tag pointing to it. So it gets assigned this name none. So if you do a lot of building, or you do a lot of pulling of newer images, you end up with all these none images. Um, and they're taking up space in your disk, and they're probably completely useless. So to tidy those up, um, you can now type docker image prune. It used to be you had to do like some command line foo to try and tidy things up, but now it's pretty easy with docker image prune. So um, when I ran this command, I clearly hadn't run it for some time, uh, and I managed to save 3.6 gigabytes, which was a bit embarrassing, really. Um, unsurprisingly, there's very similar commands for cleaning up containers. So if you run docker container prune, that's going to remove all your stop containers. And again, you may find you uh, save a surprising amount of space. Um, docker volume prune, which will remove all volumes not used by at least one container. Um, even, uh, you'll probably find you have a lot of, of volumes that you perhaps didn't expect, because a lot of uh, Docker files like Redis and MySQL, the official image, um, defines a volume in the Docker file. So every time you run that image, it's actually creating a Docker volume. Um, and you probably don't need those, so it's definitely worth running Docker volume prune now and again. Now, there's also Docker network prune, um, which will clean up uh, networks. Um, if you use Docker Compose a lot, you probably find it creates a, a network for that application. Uh, and if you've been using it a lot, yeah, you'll probably have a bunch of unused networks. So again, you can tidy those up. Um, you're probably not surprised to see that the final one is Docker System Prune, uh, and that basically runs all of the previous commands together. Um, okay, the next set of um, tips are on building images. Um, was anybody in Abby Fuller's talk yesterday? Yeah, quite a few. So I apologize, because some of these tips um, certainly overlap with Abby Fuller stuff. Um, so if you want to go and get more information, especially on building images, uh, yeah, you can go and check out her talk. I think the slides are available. Uh, and also, the, the video will be available at some point. Uh, first thing I'm going to say is 
the build context. So one thing I find really confuses new people is this idea of the build context. You know, you take this docker build dash t my image, and then you have to put this full stop at the end. Uh, and typically when you do in training, people don't put that, because they think it's a, the, you know, a full stop, and not like part of the command. Um, the dot actually stands for the current directory. So you can put any directory you like at all. Uh, and that's the build context. Uh, and the Docker file is assumed to be at the top of the build context. Um, basically, that directory is tarballed up by the Docker client and sent to the Docker daemon. So remember, Docker's got a, a client server architecture. Um, the issue there is if you try and run a Docker build um, and send, um, if you try and run a Docker build from your downloads directory or your home directory, it's going to try and tarball up everything in there and send it to the daemon, which is, you know, may take a long time. Especially if you're using a remote daemon, for example. So you really do not want to run a, a build from your home directory or downloads directory. Um, if you've got like a, you know, if your Docker file is at the top of your source repository, um, and you've maybe got like a builds directory or something, uh, which ends up containing a lot of build artifacts that your, your Docker build doesn't actually need, um, what you can do is exclude that directory by using the .docker ignore file. So that can help to cut down uh, on the amount of data that's sent to the Docker daemon and, spe and, and speed up builds. Uh, don't bust the build cache. Yeah, so you really want to add your dependencies before your source code. So if you're using npm, that means uh, your package.json. If you're using like Maven, you can, you know, there's similar things for pip uh, and Java and and so on, most programming languages that have some sort of way of installing dependencies. And what you want to do is install those dependencies before you install the rest of the source code. The problem is if you do it like on the left here, where I install a, where I uh, copy over all the source code and then I run npm install, that works. But the problem is if any, sor any file at all changes in my source code, um, that busts the build cache at that point, and I have to rerun npm install even though I'm not installing new packages. So what you want to do is copy over the, the package file by itself, um, run npm install, and then copy over the rest of the source code. So if, if, uh, if uh, when I change the source code file, um, the, the cache busts at that point. It doesn't bust up there, and I don't have to rerun the expensive npm install command. Um, minimal images. Yeah, I think uh, Abby talked about this a bit as well. Uh, if you use as small an image as possible, as in keep your base Im your images with as little software in them as possible, uh, that's got a couple of really good benefits. The first one is security. So it's just if there's less software in your container, there's less software that an attacker has to potentially exploit. Um, it's also just handy for distribution, right? Uh, you know, it's much faster to send my images to the registry, to pull them, uh, to send them to other people, etc. Uh, and you know, can potentially save you money because you're paying less network costs. <laughs> Why is this happening again? There we go. Um, so probably the most famous sort of a uh, very small base image is Alpine. Is anybody using Alpine? Yeah, I figured. <laughs> cool. So Alpine's really nice. It's only about five megabytes, which is pretty amazing. Um, and it works for the majority of use cases. But there is a couple of gotchas. Uh, the main one is it doesn't use glibc, because glibc is a really big package. It uses Muzzle as its sort of standard C library, which is much smaller. But um, you know, you, your software needs to be compiled against that, so you can run into incompatibilities. And I've also heard people complain that Muzzle was slower in certain circumstances. Um, the other thing is it uses APK as its package manager. An APK is great, but it's not as big a package manager as um, Debian's app or Red Hat's Yum, for example. So you might not be able to find the packages you want in APK, uh, which means you'll have to like go and curl them with wget them, etc. So if either of those things is an issue, uh, what you can look at is Debian Slim. So there's a ver there's a version of the, the Debian base image uh, called Debian Slim that's only about 55 megabytes in size, as opposed to, I think it's about 100 megabytes or even more for the Debian or Ubuntu images. Um, you can go even further, though. Uh, and you can actually, like if you have a programming language that can create a static binary, which is a binary of all the dependencies it needs um, statically compiled in, as opposed to reliant on dynamic libraries, 
Um, if, you could, if your language can do that, then you can just copy that single binary in to a scratch image, and the scratch image is a completely empty base image. So I've got an example here using the new sort of um, what's a multi-stage builds thing that got recently added to Docker and is really pretty nice. Um, I'm using Rust. Uh, you could also use Go or C or something, but Rust was made quite a nice uh, small example, so I chose that. Uh, and this is actually from a real code that we're using at the minute at Container Solutions. Um, so in a multi-stage build, what I've done is I've using the, the official Rust Lang build. Um, cargo build is the command to build a, a, a Rust binary. Uh, and to build a static binary, all I need to do is give it the release target and use Linux muscle as a target. Um, that creates a, a binary. Uh, and then in the second part of the build, this is one Docker file. It's got two from statements, but it's a multi-stage build. So it actually is, yeah. Uh, so in the second bit, we've got from scratch. So we're starting from an empty image, and we're copying the binary from the, the first image in to our scratch image. So now we have uh, an image with absolutely nothing in it except this one binary. And that's all I need to run my container. So that's pretty cool and completely minimal. Um, I'm also setting a user statement. Um, note, because there's no like, uh, operating system really there, I'm just on top of the kernel. I can't use um, a username. I have to use a UID, which the kernel understands. Um, I've not just chosen any UID, though. I've actually chosen 65534, because I know that corresponds to the nobody user uh, on my host. Um, and I'll explain a bit more why it's important to set a, a user later. But even in a, in a minimal image, you can set a user. Uh, the latest tag. Yeah, <laughs> this one slightly annoys me. I think it was a, a bit of a mistake to have the sort of default latest tag. I think it probably should have been called uh, default or something. Anyway, you know when you pull an image, uh, and people think there's a sort of special latest image. But in reality, there's nothing special about it at all. It's just a convention. Um, it's not guaranteed to be the newest version of an image. And it's not even guaranteed to exist. Um, there is a convention, especially in the official images, that the latest tag will point to the latest sort of stable version of the software, but that is just the convention. Um, what it is, is it's a default tag that's used if you don't specify a tag. So if I do docker push pull build of my image, that's exactly the same as if I'd said my image colon latest. Now, those commands are identical. So there's no tag, it just assumes latest. Uh, that's all the magic there is. Um, I'm building on that. You can add more meaningful tags. So you should really try and, and use meaningful names for your images. Because um, if I go into production server and I type docker ps, and I see like a you know, nginx latest running, that's really kind of annoying, because I want to know exactly which version of nginx is running, so I can tell if there's like vulnerabilities, for example. Uh, and you're just making you know, your own lives harder. So definitely try and use semantic versioning if, you've, you know, if you, you're building your application in that way, and you can put that in your image name and your tag. Um, you can also do things like uh, use your git hash, which can be very useful. So if you do this uh, git command here, that'll take a, a very short form, or I think it's the most minimal, unique uh, name for the, for the git hash of your current head. So using that, I can then go and refer to exactly the source code that was used to build the image. And the whole point of all this is just to try and make it as obvious as possible um, what code is running in production. Um, you can also go further and start adding labels. Um, so yeah, a few Docker versions back, they added this label command. It also exists uh, in this example here. I'm just passing it on the Docker build command. But you can also add labels in your Docker file. Uh, and I've added the date that this image has been created on, which you know, can be useful in certain contexts. Uh, and you can get that back with Docker inspect. Um, yeah, you can add whatever metadata you'd like at all to try and help you identify what's in the image. Uh, there is a thing called annotations. So there's an OCI image spec, and they've defined a whole bunch of annotations. That's sort of standard metadata you can add to your images. Um, and that's why you see I've done org.opencontainers.image.created rather than just created date. So this is like a defined tag that means something. Uh, and potentially, that means that other tools and software can go and look for that tag or for that label. And if they find it, you know, they can like surface extra features in uh, GUIs or tools or whatever. Um, and Gareth Rushgrove has a, a really good talk 
uh, what you gave at a previous DockerCon on why that sort of thing uh, is important. OK, container lifecycle. Um, yeah, so this is just a bunch of tips on like, uh, starting and stopping uh, and how you should think about microservices, really, um, and, and, and architecture in your application. The first thing is you really want your containers, your microservices, to start up dependently. Um, you shouldn't require your things to start in a sequence. The classic example is I have an application container which needs, a data, needs to talk to a database. Uh, and that's fine. But what shouldn't happen is uh, my application container comes up, it looks at the database, database isn't there, so it just crashes. And that's quite common, but it's, it's, it's not good. Um, what you want to happen is it comes up, looks at the database, isn't there, OK, tries again. Isn't there, OK, backs off for a second, tries again. Isn't there, OK, backs off for a minute, tries again. OK, now it's there, and I can continue on, rather than just crashing. Um, and ideally, you'll even like, uh, write that sort of back off code in your application code, so in the application itself, if you can. If you can't do that, for example, you're using third-party software, uh, what you can do is write a startup script. And that startup script will look for the dependent service um, if, and wait for it to come up before starting the main application. Uh, and Kelsey Hightower, who I'm sure most of you in here have probably heard of, uh, wrote a great blog on that called 12 Fractured Apps. So I totally recommend checking that out. Um, at the other end of the scale, you also need to shut down gracefully. So when Docker stops a container, say, to update it or just to kill it for whatever reason, what will happen is it will send the container a sig term signal. The container then gets 10 seconds to shut down by itself. If it doesn't shut down in that time, um, it just hard kills the container with a sig kill. You really don't want that last thing to happen. Um, the problem is, if you get hard killed, you don't get a chance to tidy up after yourself. Um, and the most typical problem with that is you'll drop network traffic. Uh, yeah, so if you handle SIG term properly, you can tidy up after yourself, close network co connections properly, sockets, file handles, and purge your cache if you've got one, so write final data to file or database, uh, and also output a log that you're shutting down. And also, it just means your container should shut down faster. You're not going to wait for this entire 10 seconds. Um, another Docker captain called Srinus Mackham uh, has a really big uh, blog post on all this. So if you want to know anything about it at all, basically go and look at Docker features for handling container death, which I thought was an anonymous um, title, but it's quite a good post. Um, but it's not necessarily trivial to handle signals. Um, so to make sure your application is receiving signals properly, um, it either needs to run as PID1 or you need to forward signals to it. So to run as PID1, um, that means if you use a startup script, you have to call exec to run the main application. Otherwise, your startup script will be PID1 and your main application will have some other PID. Or you need to whatever process is PID1 to forward signals to um, your application. Uh, and to do that, you can either do it yourself uh, or you can use like a supervisor program. Uh, and one really good one is Tinny. And interestingly enough, Tinny has been integrated into Docker now, and you just need to pass the dash dash init flag, and you get this sort of Tinny functionality. Um, also, there seems to be a few problems about NPM and handling signals. So if any of you have um, Node.js applications and they start at NPM, you've probably noticed they always take 10 seconds to stop, right? Uh, and the problem is it just yeah it doesn't seem to be handling signals properly. I think there are bugs and stuff open. I'm not a Node developer, so I can't go into details. Um, but if you use Node rather than npm to start your application, that will handle signals properly. Uh, and Brett Fisher, who's another Docker captain, has a really good blog post on Node and Docker, good default. So totally recommend checking that if you're doing uh, Docker and Node development. Health checks. Um, yeah, so it's used by Docker to determine the health of the container. Um, yeah, I have wrote this before the Kubernetes announcement. So um, you do have health checks both in Kubernetes and in Docker. But interestingly, in Docker um, and in Swarm, they, they find it in the Docker file. But Kubernetes defines it in the Kubernetes YAML. So I'm not sure that will get resolved going forward. But um, 
Yeah, the functionality, the idea is basically the same. So basically, you can uh, create a health check command, uh, and you can, and this is just a simple command that runs. If it returns uh, zero, that means the container is healthy. If it returns one, that means the container is unhealthy. And if you define this command, uh, and it, you've got the example here with Nginx, and what all we're doing here is curling the web page and seeing if it returns something. Um, yeah, so the reason to have a health of a container is you may have a container, you know, Docker knows if it's running, but it doesn't know if it's like stuck waiting for something, it doesn't know if it's ready to serve traffic, uh, it doesn't know if it's hung or something. So a, a container can be running but unhealthy. Uh, and in this check, we're just making sure that we can curl localhost so that Nginx has started up, for example. Um, the first thing you'll notice um, once you define a health check is that you get different output from uh, Docker PS. So we can see in this example, um, when you start up, it says health starting. And then once a number of health checks have passed, you get the healthy status. Um, but more importantly, um, Docker Swarm will only root the healthy containers. And Kubernetes has something uh, very similar. It's got readiness and liveness checks. And again, services will only root to healthy containers. And that's very important because it's essential if you want zero downtime updates. Otherwise, um, when you start up a container, it'll start receiving traffic immediately, even though it's not necessarily ready to receive traffic. Um, there's also a health check event. Uh, so you can uh, integrate uh, health checks with your own systems, for example. Um, one thing to note is that the health, ca the health check command runs in the container, as a, a Docker captain pointed out. Um, it doesn't run the host. So that's why, in this example here, I had to install curl in the container, in the image. Because otherwise, it wouldn't be there to run when it runs the health check. So the health check runs in the container itself, not on the host, which is a bit confusing at first. Um, yeah, using curl is a good start. But it does mean you've got uh, an extra dependency. Uh, it's something else to install and look after and kind of breaks my minimal images rule. Uh, it's also kind of limiting. You can only do so much with curl. Uh, so you might want to consider right now a sort of more bespoke tool uh, using the same sort of language that you wrote your application in. And actually, Elton, who's uh, the MC here, <laughs> he actually wrote a, a good uh, blog post on exactly that. So you can go and check that out later. OK, I've got a couple of tips now in security. Um, but if you want to find out anything more about security, just go and check out pretty much anything uh, Diogo, Monica, and Nathan McCauley have done. They're the security leads at Docker. Uh, and they do lots of presentations and blogs and all this stuff. Um, but I've got two easy tips. Uh, one is to set a read-only file system. So if you set a read-only file system, that can really improve security, because it means an attacker um, you know, can't deface your, your files, um, they also can't write out Trojans, backdoors, etc. in your containers. Um, yeah, and to do that, it's really easy. All you do is pass dash dash read-only, and my container will boot up with a read-only file system. Um, now, there's a slight issue in that 99% of applications do want to write to at least one or two files. So what you can do for those files is um, poke holes using volumes, and the poke holes in the read-only file system by using volumes. So in this case, I've got an Nginx container. Nginx wants to, to write a .pid file and also write uh, to a cache. So I had to, to mount var run and var cache Nginx as volumes. And then I can run Nginx. Um, I use tempfs. Um, and the main reason to use tempfs is just that I'll get cleaned up when the container stops. So I don't care about these files. They're just, you know, they're only needed for the lifetime of the container. Um, so I'm pretty happy that they get deleted uh, when the container stops. If I used volumes, you'd have to take care of removing them afterwards. Yeah, the other big one, don't run as root. Um, this is probably the number one mistake that I see people making. Um, yeah, people run containers in production where the main process is running as a root user. Uh, and people wouldn't do that in VMs, so I don't really understand why they do it in containers. Um, but basically, the problem is, if an attacker manages to uh, exploit your application in some way, uh, and that application is running as root, they will be then be root in the container. Uh, and you know, they'll have privileges to do whatever they like in the container, read and write any file, use any process, and have too many like, uh, capabilities in the kernel, etc. But also, um, if a container breakout 
was to occur, and you're able to escape from the container and onto the host. Because by default, users aren't namespaced, um, they will then be root on the host. So root in the container is the same as root on the host, unless you turn on user namespacing. Um, yeah, and if you get root on the host, it's, it's game over. Um, so it's actually normally really easy to set a user. You can just uh, use the user command in your Docker file, uh, and that will take effect from that point on in the Docker file, and also um, when the container starts up. Um, you can create a user um, for your application using standard Unix um, commands, or in a lot of cases, you can also use a nobody user, which uh, is already defined in stuff like Alpine and Debian, etc., and is defined to have a, a very limited set of capabilities. So that can be useful and a bit simpler. In some cases, though, you do want to do something that requires um, root privileges when your container starts up. So if you look at the Redis or MySQL um, uh, Docker files for the official images, and what you'll find is they do start up as root because they need to, to run a chown command, um, which is fine. But once they've run that chown command, they then switch user to a lower privileged user and start the main application. Um, yeah, and the obvious way to do that is to use sudo, which everybody, I guess, is used to. Um, but there's a problem with sudo. So I've got an example here. Uh, you can see I've installed sudo in the Debian image, um, and I'm running uh, sudo to the nobody user and running psax. And you end up with two processes running, the sudo process and the actual process I want to run psax, which is a bit annoying. Um, you know, I really just want one process, especially given the the earlier talk on um, forward and signals. So what you can do instead is use a tool called Gosu by uh, someone called Tian Gravi, and he does a, a lot of great tools and, and blogs, etc., in the on Docker and containers in general. Um, yeah, so if you use Gosu, we, um, we run nobody PSAX, where it's almost the same as sudo, but we can see we only end up with one process, which is what we want. Um, there are other ways to achieve the same effect. Uh, and if you look at the, the GitHub page for Gosu, um, the Tiananmen does list the, the other alternatives. OK, so I've got a, a couple of more tips, hopefully a bit more fun. Uh, Docker and Docker. Who runs Docker and Docker? <laughs> Quite a lot of you. So 99% of the time, you don't want to run Docker and Docker. OK, it's generally a bad idea. Um, nearly always, people are doing it for CI, CD. The problem is, if you run like true Docker and Docker, so I've got a Docker daemon running my Docker daemon, um, or in a container, um, you've got like an overlay file system inside an overlay file system. And that's just messy and slow and can break and isn't generally a great idea. Um, also, if you, the other thing is the Docker inside the Docker um, won't have access to the parent's uh, build cache or images, etc. So it has to do everything from scratch and pull images uh, and be much slower in general. Uh, and Jerome Perizzoni, who I'm sure most of you heard of, um, works with Docker and does you know, great tutorials and stuff. Um, he wrote a great blog post on exactly why you don't want to do this. Um, what you probably want to do, and hopefully what most of you that raised your hands are actually doing, is uh, just mounting the Docker socket. So I can just um, do this dash V. Uh, I mount the Docker socket into a container that has the Docker client. And then I can run Docker commands against uh, the Docker daemon on my host. So, yeah, so here we can see I've run Docker PS and I can see, uh, you know, I can create sibling containers. The thing is, now my, uh, you know, this container is effectively doing things on the same level as the host. Uh, so there is a, a security problem, but frankly, there's a security problem uh, in all forms of Docker and Docker that you need to be aware of. So that's usually the simplest uh, and most effective solution. Um, however, it does mean there's less isolation than Docker and Docker. Some people really want like, uh, you know, the docking teams to start up to only be able to see uh, themselves, if you like, and not the other stuff running on the host. So if you really do want true D&D, there's like a, a D and D image. Uh, it's a Docker image with a D and D tag, uh, and you can run that to get through Docker and Docker. It's a little bit complicated how it works. You end up using this um, link syntax to talk to the D and D uh, and run Docker commands, but it does work. Um, regarding file systems, 
99% of the time, well, maybe not even that, um, the majority of the time, you probably want the overlay file system uh, in your DND to be the same as the overlay file system on the host. So, like if you're using EFS, use EFS in the host and in the DND. Um, Docker and GUIs, yeah, so you can definitely run uh, GUI applications in containers. Uh, I've got an example here, and you know, I'll bring up Spotify. But you can also run games, Chrome, uh, and it should work pretty much fine. Um, I am kind of assuming you're running Linux here. Um, and all you need to do is mount the, the X socket uh, and set a display. Um, this is obviously for X11. Um, in the new, is anybody, is anybody here using Wayland? Yeah. Oh, yeah, one or two. So if you're using Wayland, like, uh, this command's slightly different, but it's, you can still do the same thing. Um, and Jessie Frazell, who I guess a lot of you have also heard of, she wrote a really good blog post on Docker containers on the desktop that goes through what you need to do to, to run um, GUI applications in containers. And there are good reasons to do it. Um, say you're trying out a new application and you don't want the application to like, pollute your file system and you want to make sure it gets cleaned up afterwards, you can just run it in a container and delete the container. And then it's gone, no trace on your, on your computer. So I think there are big advantages to running standard applications and containers. Um, yeah, but Jessie, as well as writing that blog post on her GitHub, um, she also has a bunch of uh, Docker files um, for running desktop applications. So you can go and have a look there and see if like, the application you want is available already. OK, so that's all my tips. Um, I kind of hope that you've um, learned something or can take away something that will make you more efficient and productive, um, even slightly happier when you're using Docker in your day-to-day -day work. Um, yeah. Thank you very much for listening. If you want to get in touch, my um, Twitter handle's there. Thank you, Adrian. That was fantastic. Um, uh, I don't think... My boss is in the audience, so I can admit that there's a lot of stuff that I didn't know that I've learned. <laughs> Thank you. Uh, we've got a few minutes for questions. If people have got questions, put your hand up or go to one of the, the up mics, and I'm sure Adrian will, will take you for a couple of minutes. So sort of on um, file system permissions, any, any top tips for using Docker, maybe in Ruby on Rails to have files that you want on your local machine and in the image to, to have all the Ruby binaries to, to run it up in, as part of the dev cycle? Best practices there for file permissions and, and users? Yeah, so that can be a pain. You mean like the file has a different pr privilege on the host and in the container? Yeah, I mean, it's just a Unix problem. Um, I'm not sure I really have a good answer. <laughs> I'm sorry. But I mean, if you're aware of the issue, you can probably figure it out. I think generally there is a solution, but it just takes some thought. Uh, hi. Uh, uh, regarding uh, working on your Mac OS uh, X, uh, do you have any guides about uh, very slow sharing file system? Do you use Docker Sync, for example? Is this on the Mac? Yeah. Yeah, so that's why I run a Linux desktop, <laughs> laptop. <laughs> so. uh, yeah, no, I think those problems are solvable. I, I go and look on the, the Docker forums. I've seen this like big long threads on how to fix that. I, I know people have fixed that in some cases, but I, I don't have the specifics, I'm afraid. And uh, actually, on that note, the, uh, the, the Docker team, the Docker for Mac team, are investing in that stuff, making it as fast yeah. as possible, yeah. No, that's two. <laughs> uh, is there a way to restrict uh, or audit what commands are executed by the Docker runtime? No, uh, actually, that should probably be a tip. I mean, if somebody can run Docker containers, they effectively have root access to the computer. If you can run Docker, con Docker containers, you know, I can, uh, I can mount any file I like from the host. Um, I can also, if I'm clever enough, I can get a Debian container, create like a, a binary, um, copy that binary out of the container, and run that binary to get root on the host. So yeah, if you give somebody access to run Docker, you've given them full access to that machine. So I wouldn't even go down that route. 
So, so that level of control comes the next step up with, uh, with, with uh, like Cube has access control, yeah. Docker E has access control. So then, so then your commands can be limited. Exactly. Like you give your developers access to, or you know, your CI CD, CD system runs your Docker and Kubernetes commands. Your developers perhaps don't do it directly. Hi. Um, this running GUI applications uh, in containers, is there any way to do this with Windows containers? Are you aware of that? Um, I guess you could run uh, an X Windows thing and get them to run there. I don't know. It's the true answer. Uh, so, so uh, apparently you can. Um, oh, cool. Um, but it, it's really quirky. You, you have to you have to go quite deep down and and, and change the way the containers start up in Windows. Uh, if you see him, there's a guy from from Docker uh, who's around the, uh, at DockerCon called um, John Stevens, who used to work on the Windows team and came to Docker. And he will tell you what you need to do. And uh, like he he'll be talking at this level, and it will be very hard to keep up with him. But you can do it. But it's not easy. Hi, uh, I was sort of looking for a pro tip here. We wanted to run uh, a Postgres for CI purposes in memory, so what we did was create a RAM disk on the host and oh, mount cool. the Postgres data directory to that. Is that any good of a practice, uh, or this is like bad and rookie way? Um, what was that, Postgres, in a, the, the, the volume was in a uh, memory? Uh, yeah, we created a RAM disk on the host yeah. and mounted the Postgres data directory to that. Oh, cool. Um, I don't know, it seems right to me. Um, yeah, you have to ask a DBA, I guess. Well, I mean, it, it, is it a rookie way or it sounds normal to you? Like a uh, I don't know if it sounds normal. I mean, it seems you've got a lot of RAM, I guess. I don't know. I, I, think it's a D, I don't think it's a Docker question. I think it's a DBA question. Oh, maybe. Thank you. Are you, are you doing that to get like a known set of test data so you can run your tests? Oh, cool. Yeah, yeah, that sounds good. So you, so you could do that. Or you could have an image that's pre-prepared with a bunch of test data. So I've got my image that's built on Postgres. It's got my schema. It's got my test data applied. And then I just spin up my container. And it's all ready with everything in it. And it's a known state for your test. Sorry, I'm like. No, that's a, uh, great. I've yeah. got time for a couple more. Can I ask, uh, if, you've, if you mount a volume from the host to a container, but you run multiple replicas, how does the volume appear? Is, do they all get the exact same volume yeah. mount from the host, or do they get their own s copy or something? Or? Uh, um, well, actually, I'm not quite sure how it works. Are you talking about Kubernetes or Swarm? I'm not 100% sure how it works, but I mean, the issue is if it starts on a different node, you've now tied those containers to that one node is the first thing. I suspect. Uh, I I don't want to give you a, a, a definitive answer, <laughs> but uh, yeah, I mean, to be honest, volumes and multiple containers are just a, a bit of a problem, full stop. I think that's probably one of the next big challenges with containers is just how do we handle state properly. And there was, I mean, there's a great startup called Flocker, but um, unfortunately it disappeared. We were trying to solve that kind of problem. Okay, I think we better make this the last one. Hi, are there uh, any built-in means of uh, making the API of Docker read only like for a sidekick container wanting to fetch metrics, et cetera? Or mm. would it be necessary to get something like an Nginx on, in front of it, accepting only get requests or whatsoever? Or is yeah. there anything not, that is... Not that I'm aware of. I think you really want to find your own API in front, like I guess you were just mentioning there. Okay. All right, thanks. Okay, thanks very much, everybody. Thanks for sticking by. Uh, I'm sure you'll, you'll see Adrian around if you didn't get a question answered. <laughs>